Sometimes, what made an individual famous is not their long list of achievement during their life. Sometimes, it's the end of their life. I'm sure you've heard many tales of heroic sacrificial acts by characters in popular media or even real person in history. And to some, that last moment might leave an impact on you. But in the case of Carl Patterson Smith, his last act was not heroic at all. It's just... how should I put it? Scientific? Or was it really? So, let me brought up the question. Who exactly is Carl Patterson Smith? Carl Patterson Smith was born in Lake Forest, Illinois on June 19, 1890. He was one of the most important herpetologists from the last century. For a random person, his achievements might not be important at all. He didn't discover anything major that shook the scientific community or anything like that. But, if you ask a zoologist, then of course he is somewhat incredible. He had gone to several expeditions to the Central and South Americas, including Puerto Rico, Honduras, Brazil and the surrounding countries, Guatemala, and Peru. He described a lot of animals, as you can see here. His name is also used as the species epithet for many animals. That shows how respected he is in the herpetology community. He also published hundreds of scientific articles as you can see here. Most of his life was spent at the Wild Museum, Chicago. He was named assistant curator of reptiles and amphibians there back in 1922. In 1937, his career advanced to the curator of reptiles. In 1941, he became the chief curator of zoology. He finally retired in 1955, yet he was made curator emeritus and continued working there. That is until 1957, still at the Field Museum, when the incident happened. September 25, 1957 A snake was brought by Mr. Truitt of the Lincoln Park Zoo for identification to the museum. The snake was estimated to be around 30 inches known to be an African snake. Identification should be easy, it should be boomslang, but one problem existed. The anal plate was undivided. At that time, there was no record of boomslang having undivided anal plate. And so, Dr. Smith, Mr. Truitt, Dr. Robert Evinger, and Hyman Marx discussed the possibility of the snake being a boomslang. The snake was being held by Dr. Robert F. Inger, and then, Dr. Smith proceeded to grab the snake behind the head. That's when the incident happened. Dr. Smith got bitten on the side of his left thumb. Only the right rear fang punctured his thumb. Thinking that the bite was not severe and the snake was still a juvenile, Dr. Smith did not do anything special. The punctures bled freely, and I sucked them vigorously. That's taken word to word from his writing. At the end of the work hour, he began writing the sequence known as the Death Diary. September 25th, 4.30 to 5.30. Strong nausea, but without vomiting. During trip to Homewood on suburban train. 5.30 to 6.30. Strong chill and shaking. Followed by fever at 101.7 degree, which did not persist. Blankets and heating pad. Bleeding of mucous membranes in the mouth began about 5.30. Apparently mostly from gums. 8.30 p.m. Ate two pieces of milk toast. 9 p.m. to 12.20 a.m. Slept well. No blood in urine before going to sleep, but very small amount of urine. Urination at 12.20 a.m. mostly blood, but small in amount. Mouth had bled steadily as shown by dried blood at both angles of mouth. A good deal of abdominal pain, mainly from gas. Continuing to 1 p.m., only inadequately relieved by belching. A little fitful sleep until 4 a.m. when I took an enema, bowels having failed to move the previous day. Took a glass of water at 4.30 a.m., followed by violent nausea and vomiting. The contents of the stomach being the undigested supper. Felt much better and slept until 6.30 a.m., September 26. 6.30 a.m. Temperature 98.2 degree. Ate cereal and pochek on toast and applesauce and coffee for breakfast at 7. Slight bleeding is now going on in the bowels, 
with frequent irritation to the anus. No urine with an ounce or so of blood about every three hours instead of the several ounces of urine to be expected. Mouth and nose continuing to bleed, not excessively. And that's it. That's the extent of the diary. At that time, the man was still alive. It was said that Dr. Smith was active and felt so well after eating breakfast. He called the museum around 10 o'clock to tell them he would return to work the next day. He ate at noon, but then vomited after it. It became difficult to breathe, worse and worse, until his gasping can be heard all over the house. His wife called the inhalator squad and family physician. Dr. Smith had turned bluish. Resuscitation returned his skin color to normal for a short while. He was then brought to the Ingalls Memorial Hospital and arrived slightly before 3 p.m. But unfortunately, he was pronounced dead from respiratory paralysis. The next day, September 27th, the autopsy was performed at 9.30 a.m. He was bleeding internally from basically everywhere. Hemorrhages in the small intestines, the colon contents were blood-stained, the 4 cc of urine resembled pure blood, brain was hemorrhaging with free blood in the cerebral ventricles, smaller hemorrhages in the eyes. Both kidneys contain fluid blood and clots. Spleen enlarged. Small bleedings occurred in the heart walls and in the lungs. While postmortem hemorrhages might happen because of the 18 hours delay of autopsy, it was deducted that death may be caused by clots in the pulmonary vessels. The direct cause of death was respiratory failure. During the identification, he emphasized a lot on the anal plate, and I would like to talk about that. In herpetology, especially reptiles, Meristic characters, especially scales, are often used to be an important diagnostic character. As you might have guessed, there are variants in these characters, which is why it's usually written in range. As we got more specimens, we also update this range. It also applies to whether the anal plate is divided or not. Sometimes, this difference can indicate a different species. At that time, we simply didn't know that boom slang can have undivided anal plate, so it's rational to discuss about it, because it's possible that it might not be a boom slang at all. Now, let me talk about some things about the incident. First of all, yes, younger snakes tend to produce less venom amount than adults. Does that make them less dangerous? In surface level theory, yes. In practice, most likely no. Nowadays. You could even hear people argue that younger snakes are more dangerous than the adult because they couldn't control the amount of venom injected and they tend to be more easily agitated. Is that true? In surface level theory, yes. In practice, we don't really know. The point is, just stay away, be safe, don't take your chances, never underestimate them. Second of all, we know that boom slang is dangerous. So, why would he be so nonchalant about it? Well, boom slang is an opistoglyphous snake in the Colubridae family. I'm sure Dr. Smith or at least one of his colleagues knew about that. The thing is, there was, or maybe still is, a few that think opistoglyphous snakes are harmless to human. While it is outrageous to most herpetologists nowadays, it might have been the common perception at the time, which is why they underestimated the bite. But, there was already a study back in 1940 stating how potent boom slang's venom is. So, was it simply the case of Dr. Smith's not knowing about that? Or was it just an underestimation? I'm not sure. To add into that, there is a thing called dry bites in snake bite cases. It's when no venom is injected during a snake bite. The chance of dry bite occurring from an opistoglyphous snake's bites are relatively high. The boom slang and other opistoglyphous snake inject their venom with duvenoid glands. To put it very simply, it's less effective than the venom gland in vipers and alapids. Opistoglyphous snakes usually need to bite over and over again to make sure the venom is injected. That might also be why Dr. Smith underestimated the bite, because it was just a single bite from the right side of the fang. Now, 
Of course, a single byte could be enough for the injection. This incident being the perfect example of it. Okay, so, even after all of this happened, after showing symptoms, why didn't Dr. Smith do anything? There are at least two reasoning for this. The first is, because it's an African snake. If you didn't know, let me tell you that anti-venoms are mostly species-specific. They are made to combat specific venom from specific species. Boomslang anti-venom had already been made around the 1940s, but it's basically only available in Africa, because that's where boomslang is. At that time, it is safe to assume that a boomslang anti-venom would not be available in the US. Dr. Smith, being a very experienced herpetologist at that time, should definitely knew about that. What Dr. Smith and most likely anyone at that time didn't know is, the North American anti-venom for the rattlesnakes could actually combat the venom of boomslang to some extent. This research was published in 2017. So, seriously, no one would know and would just assume otherwise in the last century. The second reasoning is, he simply didn't want to. It's possible that he simply wanted to document the effect of boomslang venom in real time. You know, as a scientist. Some sources stated that, when he was asked if he wanted medical care, he refused because it would upset the symptoms, which might sound outrageous to most people, but it's rational, to some extent. I've seen some articles or videos labeling his death as the aftermath of negligence. Some stated that curiosity killed him, overconfidence killed him, death caused by being a true scientist, and others. To me personally, all of those sounds really judgmental and unnecessary. At the end of the day, we cannot be sure of what was he thinking back then. Even if he did say he didn't seek medical care because it would upset the symptom, he could just simply be lying. Because, you know, maybe he thought nothing could be done anyway, so he just did what he could do, as a scientist. But again, it's just assumptions and possibilities. Things that can never be confirmed, because the man is no longer here. Only he could know for sure what he was thinking. And, to be honest, maybe he himself weren't sure what he was thinking. Instead of judging and labeling him, just learn from what happened. Never underestimate snakes. Actually, just don't underestimate any danger at all. Be safe, and just live more. That's all for now.